Uh, my name is Angelica, and as um, Anthony said, I have a small animal reproduction clinic in Cambridge, and I see quite a lot of clients from all over, the, I would say, almost the UK. And what I'm trying to do is maybe play a little bit devil's advocate and take the side of the breeders that I work with and the things they tell me about their vets. And one of the things I would say that breeders are different from pet owners, and I'm sure all of you are aware of that, that breeders don't like to spend money at the vets, which can be a very difficult because they'll spend their money on the internet buying all sorts of gadgets and powders, but they are reluctant to pay for certain tests. Uh, breeders quite often feel misunderstood by vets, and maybe that's because sometimes there's the attitude that breeders are in it for the money or things like that. Um, I do think that breeders are knowledgeable about their animals. They um, have lived with them often for many, many years. They are particularly knowledgeable about certain breeds and I find that um, you can really learn about breed differences by talking to breeders who've kept one kind of animal for many years and whole families of them and different age groups. And breeders do care about their animals, the ones that I see anyway, because they do bother to um, come to a specialist and they travel for many, many miles. Another issue is that although a lot of areas of veterinary small animal, um, small animal practice are now insurance driven, most reproductive problems are excluded from insurance and breeders have a uh, quite often lots of animals so it's very expensive or it would be very expensive for them to insure them so many of them are not insured therefore I think it's important that vets take careful history and focus on the problem that they want to investigate and also stay in touch with the breeder to discuss what they want to do what the cost is and what the possible outcome of the treatment or the investigation will be and I think that's maybe more important than in, in a pet uh, ownership. This is just a small reminder that ovary is not the only solution to all reproductive problems. Uh, of course, it does away with most of them, but it also does away with all of reproduction. So it's a very radical option, and unfortunately, I feel that it's suggested um, maybe a little bit too often. I think that good veterinary support for breeders results in a good success rate and so if you do have breeders in the area they can become a certain niche market in the practice they will bring their puppies they will be vaccinated wormed and the puppies go away with vaccination records with your name on them hopefully what can vets provide for breeders they can very importantly uh, provide optimal mating time problems with fertility parturition and neonatology. Those are the four areas that breeders are interested in and that can um, really do with veterinary input. This is just to give you a small overview of the reproduction of the dog. Every animal has devised their own reproductive strategy to, to maximize the number of offspring they can produce and bitches have developed a, a system that is slightly different to a lot of other mammals and in I've sort of tried to put it in red the things that bitches do different say from horses, cows, sheep, humans, cats and all the rest of it. So bitch, uh, bitches are non-seasonal monoestrous and if you look at thousands of animals you get an average of a uh, canine cycle every seven months. The estrus period is followed by a diestrus period, which is around between 60 and 70 days, regardless of whether the animal is pregnant. And then the diestrus period is followed by an unestrus period. The unestrus period is the prolactin phase of the cycle where nothing very much happens. The Easter cycle itself in the bitch is, is very long. So in a way, they make up for not coming into season by having a very prolonged season. And within that season, they also have a lot of ways of having a very, very 
large window of opportunity. So pro-estrus starts um, is induced by estrogen itself, increases the swelling, you get bleeding and certain behavioral changes. Pro-estrus usually lasts from anything to four to five days to sometimes 18 or 20 days. Estrus, estrus itself is induced by the drop of estrogen and the rise of progesterone. And the strange thing that dogs do is they increase progesterone in the unovulated follicle. And this is not the case in any other mammals. In any other mammal, the progesterone is pretty much zero at the time of ovulation. And then once the bitch has ovulated, progesterone is inc keeps being produced. So the follicle grows into corpus luteum and progesterone is produced for 60 to 65 days. And this is the case regardless of whether the bitch is pregnant or not. The reason is that in a, in a wolf pack, for example, all the females come into season together. Uh, only the alpha female will have a litter, but because the rest of the females go through progesterone phase, they will all come into milk together and be able to suckle the, the puppies when they're born. So, false pregnancy is actually a physiological condition in the dog. It's completely normal, although sometimes it's, um, it can be very difficult for the owners because the, the bitches can go, go a little bit over the top. Dogs are spontaneous ovulators, unlike the cat, the, uh, which are induced ovulators. And Ovulation occurs over a very short period of time. It's about 8 to 12 hours. The reason why I'm saying that is that sometimes breeders believe that when you have a smaller puppy in a litter, for example, that the smaller puppy was fertilized at a different time because they've had two or three matings. But usually what happens is that the oocytes are released uh, within a short period of time and they usually fertilize within a short period of time as well. Now, the canine oocyte has to undergo another meiotic division before fertilization. And this is very unusual. In most other species, for example, the horse, horse vets will be scanning follicles forever because the oocyte only lives for about 12 hours after ovulation. In the canine, the oocyte is not ready and has to undergo another division, which takes 48 hours, two days. So if you look at the events, so this is LH peak, which is in proestrus. You have ovulation. And after ovulation, it takes two days for the oocyte to mature, mature. And then the fertilization period starts. Now, here is another speciality that dogs have. The oocyte is fertile for two days, sometimes even three days. And so that's a very, very long time. Usually oocytes only live for about 24 hours. Now, we distinguish between the fertilization period, which is two to three days, it's the oocyte, and the fertile period. The fertile period is 10 days. And this is another opportunity to increase the offspring, is that sperm survival in females in the canine is very long. So a young, fertile male would have sperm that can survive for seven days. Optimum mating time has been, humans have been breeding dogs for probably 10,000 years. And there, there are very good ways of looking at the bitch and finding out when they're ready. So one is that the bitch is standing and receptive. Unfortunately, that doesn't always work because some bitches like certain dogs or they don't like other dogs or they might be influenced by the owner that's in the room or they might be bitches that are very dominant and they don't like the idea of being mated. So the standing and receptive is, is a good indicator, but it doesn't always work. There's dogs that know the right time, but there's quite a lot of dogs who are not really all that bothered about the right time as long as they get anywhere near the female, so then that doesn't work. The breeding on set days, for example, day 11, and 13 is quite common in working kennels. Uh, I've, I see it in Labrador kennels or in uh, border collies. 
and because of the long sperm survival and the long oocyte survival, breeding on set days isn't such a bad system. They tend to get pregnancy rates between around 70%, I would say, if you keep selecting for fertile animals. So in breeding on set days kennels, very often if a bitch hasn't taken or a dog hasn't produced a litter, after two attempts they're excluded. And so over many, many generations they have fairly high fertility and so it works quite well. Some breeders like to use gadgets like the, I don't know if you've heard of Draminsky, uh, saliva cytology and things like that. But the Draminsky doesn't work at all. It is actually a, a gadget that was developed for fox farming and doesn't work in dogs. Uh, saliva cytology, I think, is extremely difficult to find a microscope in everything. Color change of discharge is an indicator. They go, after the estrogen phase, they go from, um, from a bloody discharge to a serum color. And also, the, the decrease in vulvar swelling is a good indicator that the estrogen phase is finished and the progesterone phase has started. What we offer as veterinary surgeons is progesterone testing. And with progesterone testing, we can not only predict ovulation, we can also confirm that ovulation has taken place. So if a breeder, for example, or an owner is not sure that the bitch has had a season or that she has ovulated, you can look at progesterone for the next 60 days to see if she had a season. Some bitches are very, very clean or they have very little discharge and they have what's called silent seasons. And if a breeder suspects that the bitch is having silent seasons, it's a good idea as soon as there's any interest from a male or there's swelling to start progesterone testing. The other thing we can use progesterone for is to look at luteal function during pregnancy. And there are some breeds like German Shepherds, Old English Sheepdogs, which do not produce enough progesterone until day 61 when they should be whelping. Sometimes they drop off at day 54, 55, and so you get premature puppies being born which uh, unfortunately die. And we can monitor luteal function and we can supplement progesterone. It's not as common as people like to believe, but it does happen. And the last thing we can use uh, progesterone for quite well is to predict parturition which is also a really important factor in um, reproduction. I just wanted to go through the ELISA tests very, very quickly because there are quite a lot of practices that offer ELISAs and they don't always work. And unfortunately, if you offer an ELISA and it doesn't work, it puts people off progesterone testing, which I think is a real shame because the wrong time of mating is the most significant cause for infertility in dogs. There was a very good study in Utrecht where they looked at any bitch that had been mated twice and didn't conceive and all they did is progesterone tested them and then mated them according to the progesterone test and 75% of them became pregnant. So um, good progesterone testing is a really useful tool. So we can have ELISA tests in-house. They can be kept in the fridge. You have instant results. Uh, it's a reasonable price. They're not cheap, but they're comparable to the laboratory price. They're not quite as accurate as the laboratory tests, especially in the, the medium area. So the ELISAs are very accurate when the progesterone is very low, and the ELISAs are very reliable when the progesterone is very high. They're not so good in the middle when you're trying to predict what's going to happen. ELISAs depend very much on the person doing them, and I la run the ELISAs with students, and quite often we run the same blood sample and get two different results and sometimes three different results. So although you're only adding a few drops here and there, it's really important that the person running them keeps an eye on it and concentrates on it because a lot depends on the outcome of the result. A lot of the advice that you're going to give to the breeder depends on the result of that test. The other problem with the ELISAs can be that they have quite a small test window. So you, they go up to sort of 10 nanograms, which is, is not that high. So the way it works is that the, they have to, the, the one that I used, the pre-made, has two test windows. One is 3 nanograms, 
or 6 nanomoles, which is low, and then the other one is high when they have ovulated. And bitches ovulate between 5 and 6 nanograms. So the premade gives you one before and one after ovulation, and you compare the color with the samples. This is just to show you a little setup. It's important that you use um, indelible ink because you have to wash the wells. And if you have like here two samples and two standards, you don't you end up not knowing what's what if you haven't signed it properly. You need a timer. It's a good idea to keep them on a white surface because the color change isn't too pronounced. Um, and then you can see the different colors. So the way the ELISA works is that that's the 3 nanograms, so that's the low progesterone, and the high progesterone becomes paler and paler. And this, for example, is a very high progesterone, and this is a very low progesterone. Sorry, I'm just going to go back to that. What I'm trying to show you here is there's different ways of using the progesterone. The, the two Oh, there's several reasons why sometimes the ELISAs don't work. One is that if a bitch arrives at the surgery, say on Monday morning, you've never seen her before, and people ask for a progesterone test, and you get this kind of color, the, the one on the left, the one with the pale color, then you are outside the window of the test. Because if your first test says that ovulation has occurred, you don't know when it occurred because progesterone stays high for the next 60 days. So sometimes people ring me up and they say, oh, we've done a progesterone and it didn't work. And I say, how many progesterones have you done? And they say, oh, we did one. And it said mate immediately. If your first progesterone says mate immediately, then you don't know. They may still be in estrus. They may still be in the fertile and the fertilization period, but they could also be three weeks over it. The other one is that you get a color which is a sort of medium pink and the test book tells you that ovulation is imminent. Unfortunately, ovulation can be imminent for quite a few days and if you remember that we are testing for ovulation and not and after ovulation it takes two days for the oocyte to mature, if you are four days or five days before ovulation you will not have get a, a pregnancy. The other reason why I wanted to show you these wells is that the well in the very middle, the very pink one, was a bitch that came in because she had started to whelp and then the owner felt that she'd stop whelping and we did a progesterone to see and you could see that the progesterone had completely disappeared. There was very little progesterone left which meant that this bitch was ready to give birth and something had happened. And actually, when we opened her up, she had ruptured her uterus. And that's why she went into first stage and then stopped. One of the things you can do when you have a bitch that has possibly gone over, so you have a very high progesterone, but you're not sure when she ovulated, you can do a vaginal cytology. And the vaginal cytology is really very simple. You just use it like a, a blood smear, diff quit, quick it, and have a look at the vaginal cells. This is a vaginal cell during um, the fertile period. What you see is very high cornification of the vaginal cells. The, the, the estrogen builds up the cells, and because estrogen's dropped off, they die off, they cornify. You see uh, pignotic nuclei, uh, but you also see a very clean background. There's not many bacteria, there's no white blood cells. And so if you had a bitch with a high progesterone, and this kind of cytology, then she's ready for mating. If you had a bitch with high progesterone and this vaginal cytology, you see lots of neutrophiles, and you see these non-cornified vaginal epithelial cells, then she has gone over. So vaginal cytology is quite a good way of backing up your progesterone if, if you're not 100% sure. There's a little 
chip um, with a pre-made uh, because you have to buy five or ten tests you can freeze the conjugates and just thaw them out in lukewarm water and then use them and that this way the tests will last longer you also have to watch your uh, room temperature so for example if you in the winter time if the the room that you're working in doesn't is not heated during the the night then your worktops are quite cold and the test takes a lot longer because it's an enzyme linked test and the other way around if it's very hot in the summer the test is much faster so always test until ovulation has occurred and when the first test indicates it's high then you're outside the test window. Also, I think it's important to test in uh, sensible intervals. You, you have to remember that we're looking at two days after ovulation and then the fertile period is for two days. So you have a lot of time when you look, we're testing for ovulation. I do testing with uh, people that after the bitch has ovulated travel all the way to Finland or Italy or all over Europe really and there, there is plenty of time. The other thing you have to remember is that although the, the progesterone test in the surgery may not be a very expensive test, when you say to the breeder, yes, you know, she has ovulated, you can go to the stud dog, that is a lot of money that's being spent on your advice because they could travel for a long time. The stud fee is usually the price of one puppy. So if you're thinking bulldogs, for example, people could be paying £2,000 for a stud fee. And so the test is really, really important to the breeder. When you do send it to a laboratory, it's important that they don't do an ELISA. They actually do either a radioimmunoassay or a chemiluminescence test. And there's a, um, sometimes people tell me they didn't get the result until four days later, but there is a guaranteed next day delivery service. And you have to sort of arrange the testing to avoid weekends and bank holidays, which, you know, in the last two weeks has been virtually impossible, but normally it does work. Unfortunately, there are two ways of measuring progesterone. One is nanograms and one is nanomoles. It's a bit like uh, miles and kilometers. Most laboratories, IDEX, Cambridge Specialist Lab, measure in nanomoles. So that's the, the one we're going to look at. Ovulation occurs between 5 and 7 nanograms or 15 and 20 nanomoles and that's what we're looking for. What, when they start to get to sort of three to seven nanomoles, you know that the progesterone is starting to rise. Once they get past 70, although that's not as reliable as the ovulation itself, once they start to get past 70 nanomoles, they've usually gone over the fertile period. The way to look at spacing progesterone is that it roughly doubles every two days. So what I would suggest is if the progesterone is very low, below 3 nanomoles, then retest in 4 days. If it's less than 6 nanomoles, then 3 days. And once it starts to go over that, you have to retest um, in 2 days. You never have to test in, on two consecutive days. Even if you think that ovulation would occur on that day, it's better to wait another day and then look back and say, for example, so for example, if you took a Monday sample, ovulation hadn't occurred, it was like 10 nanomoles. You could then do a Wednesday sample, and if the Wednesday sample is 25 nanomoles, you know that the bitch has ovulated on the Tuesday. You add one or two days, so you would say this bitch could be mated on Thursday, Friday, or Saturday. It's always a good idea to have a little piece of paper and write it down before you ring the breeder because they tend to have all sorts of organizational problems and they can't have the car on this day and the stud dog's not available on that day. But as long as you map out the three days, I would say best time of mating is plus one, plus two, plus three days or from ovulation or, for example, plus two days, plus four days from ovulation. So these, these are just some suggestions um, for people to travel. It doesn't matter if they can only do plus one and plus two because, for example, the, the sperm survival time should be fine.
When you monitor ovulation and you have young healthy animals, you should be possible to achieve about a pregnancy rate of 80%. I just wanted to do something on, on the pregnancy of dogs, so uh, once your ovulation testing works well, you should see a lot of pregnant animals, and there's still a slight hesitation on the veterinary side when people come in and say, oh, the bitch is 65 or 67 days pregnant, uh, and a lot of people will say, oh, bitches can go over and they can be, 60, uh, they can be 7 days pregnant. Bitches are never 70 days pregnant. What happens is that the pregnancy starts seven days after the mating. And of course, that can happen because we talked about sperm survival. But most bitches are pregnant for 63 days from ovulation or 61 days from fertilization. In some smaller breeds, there seems to be a disposition for very early whelpings, but Puppies born before 57 days of gestation don't have a good survival rate. In combination with the fact that we still say to people, well, you know, they can go over to 68, 69 days, primary inertia is the most common cause of whelping problems in the dog. So I think you're more likely to see if somebody says that the bitch is 65 days or 66 days, there is just as high a possibility that you're looking at primer inertia than there is of a bitch that's, you know, been mated too early. So it's really important that practitioners take breeders seriously when they think, you know, when they say that the bitch has gone over. One thing that um, I always say to breeders is to measure body temperature because especially in medium and small sized dogs, the drop in temperature is very marked and if you measure temp body temperature twice a day with the same thermometer, 24 hours before they, 12 to 24 hours before they give birth, the temperature will drop 2 degrees. It doesn't work quite so well in, um, in very large dogs because they have such big body mass that they don't cool down so well. Um, another warning sign, obviously, is if they've shown sign of nesting, first stage labor, and then they stop. And a definite no-no is green or black discharge, because we're talking utroverdine. And if you have a bitch that comes in, and I, I've had breeders on the phone that have said they've been to the vet, and the vet says to give him another six or eight hours to see if they can produce a puppy. So once you see green or black discharge, obviously we're talking placental separation and something needs to be done. This is just to see the, the how acute the drop is at the time of parturition, the progesterone drop. And so if you do a pre-made, and if you remember the, the wells that we saw, if the well is very, very pink, then the progesterone has gone and the bitch is ready to mate, uh, to to give birth, and if she's not giving birth, she probably has either prima inertia or dystochia or some problem. When you're looking at parturition and there's a problem, or say it's a bulldog and they've she's never self-whelped and they're very, very um, stressed out, you have to do ta daily testing. It's At the time of mating, I said never daily testing, but at the time of parturition, daily testing is a really good idea. Single puppy pregnancies, are you can do the progesterone testing. It doesn't always work. The drop in progesterone in single puppy pregnancies is not always as marked. So single puppy pregnancies are difficult to, um, to follow and have a successful outcome. The best way is if you know the time of ovulation, but a lot of times when you have single puppy pregnancies, they are single because the mating was at the wrong time, and very often they did not do progesterone testing. Bitches with very large litters also have primary inertia quite often because the uterine wall is so extended that it cannot contract. Um, you have certain breeds like bulldogs where the cesarean rate is very, very high. This is just to show you a puppy that we delivered, and it was, you can see the little pink tongue did survive, and there was um, green discharge. 
and that was the thing. Okay, different subject. I wanted to talk about some of the uh, drugs that have c come out in the last few um, years and their uses and some of their off-label uses. So we'll be speaking about agliprestone, alizine, supraloran, desrolin, and ibozan. First one is alizine. I'm going to use the product name because the, it's easier. So, um, in alizine we use agliprestone. It's closely related to a human abortive drug and it's a synthetic steroid which goes to the progesterone receptors and in, particularly in the uterus of bitches, cats and rabbits and it has a strong binding affinity without actually causing the reaction of progesterone. It's used in uh, misalliance in bitches, two injections within 24 hours. The reason for that is that the um, because it's such a dangerous drug for humans, the concentration is not very high and you have to give very high volumes and it is slightly irritating at the injection side. So to get the right dose rate, and you must have the accurate weight for the correct dose, because otherwise it doesn't always work and when you do dose them correctly it has a very very high efficacy so you need two injections within 24 hours it's 10 milligrams per kg is the the um, concentration you can cause abortions quite easily between day 0 and 45 in the first 22 days it is pretty much 100% and after 22 is about 95% you will still cause abortions all the way through or induce parturition if you give it later. Um, it's not licensed, but it can be used in Queens. I've, I've used it quite a few times, quite successfully. There's one problem with the agliprestone. It's metabolized more quickly by cats, and so you need to have a slightly higher dose at 15 milligrams. And you can give it, because they're induced ovulators, you can give it any time um, as quickly after the mating as you like. Sorry, I'd just like to go back to the two injections within 24 hours. It's best to give the um, alizine at the end of estrus. One of the, th there's two reasons why sometimes the alizine hasn't worked. One is that the bitch is in pro estrus, so she hasn't actually started the rise in progesterone. She hasn't actually ovulated, but the owners think, well, the owners see that she's in seasons and she's been mated. And so the alizine is given very early. And either the sperm survives longer than the alizine, because the alizine isn't that long acting. It only lasts for about four or five days. And the sperm can outlive it. Or sometimes the bitch is mated again later on in, in her season and then not injected again because the peop the, it's, she's either not seen or the owners think that she's covered by the injection. So it's best if you have um, a bitch, it's best to ask them to come in at the end of the season or wait another few days after the mating to inject them. And this is not the case, that's why I thought about it. This is not the case in cats because they're induced ovulators and so you can inject them as early as possible. Um, alizine can be used for non-surgical treatment of pymetra. Um, they do that quite a bit uh, on the continent because they don't over hysterectomize um, every animal that goes through the surgery uh, because then if they're not allowed to. It's uh, illegal in some countries to neuter. Uh, for non-medical reasons and so when they have females that uh, have pymetra and they still want to be used for breeding uh, they can be treated. The pregnancy rate is not not bad after the uh, at the next season is about 50 percent and when they've been treated with alizine and um, antibiotics the reoccurrence rate is only about 10 percent which I would have thought would be higher but it's not. The important thing about treating animals with pyometra is that they're well enough. So the success will only start a few days into the treatment and not like with surgical um, treatment straight away. So 
you have to make a clinical decision whether you think the animal is well enough to undergo medical treatment rather than surgical treatment. In older animals, it can sometimes, they can be so critically ill or so unwell that you think they might die during the operation and it could be helpful to open the cervix in closed parameter cases, have all the pus come out. You can also put them on a drip and then the operation itself is easier because the uterus is smaller and the toxic effect, the animal, you know, might be a little bit better when you're doing surgery. One thing is if you do treat pyometra in and you do if you do send them home, it's really important to say to the owners not to keep them in a nice room in the living room or something. They really need to be in a room with lots of newspaper on the floor. So the the suggestions is to give um, three injections, one day one, day two and day seven. In Queens it's uh, again a higher dose rate but similar injections. Uh, antibiotics have to be given for a long time afterwards because the uterus is quite difficult to, to clean out. It's always a good idea after the treatment, say on day of two weeks later, to do an ultrasound and make sure there's not too much fluid or there shouldn't be any fluid in the uterus. Induction of parturition is done uh, sometimes for medical reasons or in some countries, uh, dare I say it, they don't like to have litters on Sundays because they find the puppy survival rate isn't so good on Sundays and so they induce them so they're born on Fridays or Saturdays. You really should not induce uh, bitches unless, well, if, if you want to induce the, the birth because the bitch is not well, then you can do that. But um, for uh, normal parturition, you really have to do ovulation testing and you should be at least 58 days after ovulation. Once you've injected them, it takes about 30 hours, so it takes quite a long time for the birth to commence. You can treat uh, feline mammary hyperplasia with alizine and the reason why it might be worth treating it is it seems to be a one-off occurrence so if you have a, a queen that's very valuable and she develops this condition once she's been treated they will um, there's a very very low reoccurrence rate maybe two to five percent It also sometimes works with some mammary or vaginal tumors. I've not used it for mammary tumors because I think mammary tumors need you know, surgical treatment. But sometimes vaginal tumors can be quite large and difficult to operate. And if you can shrink them a little bit before the operation and they tend to be benign, then that can be a benefit. Disadvantage um, of uh, alizine is that it's expensive, especially in larger breeds and sometimes it can irritate the injection site. The next one is suprelerin. Um, suprelerin supra, is an implant that is a GNRH super agonist. So it's not an antagonist, it's a super agonist. And the way it works, it, it's a slow release and it's, re it's absorbed. It overstimulates the receptor. So in the first two weeks, the, the implant has a different activity to the next six months. In the first two weeks, it tends to overstimulate the pituitary and there's a, a large production of FSH and LH. And after that, it reduces the um, amount of FSH and LH that's produced. And because it reduces it, the, the ejaculate volume is reduced, sperm production, um, there's a high percentage of abnormality in the sperm that is left, and the libido is increased. Basically, it's, it's a chemical castration. The advantage is that it's a non-surgical contraceptive. It has very few side effects, so it's not like TARDAC. Um, it's interesting to use in dogs where you think you're not maybe sure whether castration is the right thing. There are quite a few studies now where um, they say that if dogs are very low in the pecking order and you castrate them, it makes them even more fearful and more aggressive. And so if you're not sure it's a good idea to castrate a dog, the implant will just chemically castrate it for six months and then they tend to come back into testosterone production after, well, 
usually within 12 months. One of the disadvantages that um, breeders tell me is that sometimes the testicles tend to shrink, but usually it's it's only about 20%, so it's not too bad. But in some animals, they, they shrink quite a bit, and because um, a lot of judges make sure that they have two descended testicles, sometimes they don't like it. Also, you have this, uh, because it's a super agonist, you have a transient increase of testosterone, so you have to deal with that if you have a dog that's sort of showing a lot of male behavior, the first two weeks can be difficult. And the length of the implant varies between individuals. Usually you can just see by the size of the testicles how long the implant is working and when it's starting to wear off. Because it's um, a chemical castration, you can use it for anal adenomas and that is useful. It can also be used in cats, and what you see is in tom cats the penile spikes disappear within two to four weeks, and the suppression because they're much smaller animals and they're, and they're more susceptible. The suppression lasts for 12 to 24 months, and the testicles disappear completely. It really looks like they they've been castrated. So, for example, if you had had a cattery that wanted to keep some toms uh, active. Uh, but not you know fighting with each other or not competing with each other then they could implant some of them and leave the others although fertility should come back i think it's important that when you implant very i would not implant a very very valuable animal because i think you have to stress to the breeders that there's no guarantee also if they re-implanted or like in a cat if it's two or three years older by the time it comes back you don't know what spermatogenesis would be like even through the normal aging process because it's a uh, because this rorolin works with FSH and LH it can also be used in the female and in the female it has two activities one is that if you implant a bitch and these are trials that they've not been licensed yet. So if you implant a bitch in estrus, she will then and she will then not come into season for the next six months and you can re-implant them every six months and they will not come into season. And the reason why this is quite useful is that in some countries they don't spay so much and also it seems to um, prevent the hair changes in some breeds. I don't know if you've ever seen some of the cocker spaniels or setters that get become wire haired after they've been spayed. So you can chemically castrate or sterilize a female without the changes in the coat. And it's been used also a lot in, in um, cats in zoos and safari parks and things like that. One interesting use of this laurelin is that if you implant it during unestrus, in the first two weeks, it causes the the growth of the follicles, FSH, LH, and induces ovulation. So if you implant a bitch that is in unestrus, they will usually come into season within four or five days and then ovulate within 10 days. And then you, once they've ovulated, you can remove the implant. So what you do is you put the implant somewhere um, near the navel, for example, where you can find it very easily. The problem is that not all bitches ovulate. And some bitches need progesterone supplementation during pregnancy, and so you have to test them again um, during the pregnancy to make sure they're producing enough progesterone. I think it's very useful for bitches. I've had a few where they've never seen them in season for for many, many um, years, or they've had one season and now they haven't had a season for many years. In ferrets, I don't know if you're aware of, uh, but in ferrets, uh, Suprarolin now is, is very well known. Um, they talk about it, they come into the surgery. So basically, it's, it prevents uh, hyperandrogenism and hyperestrogenism, but it also means that they don't get cushions later in life. So the problem in ferrets is that when you do neuter them, they will develop cushions later in life. But if you use the implant, they will not. They will be chemically neutered and not develop cushions. The nice thing about the implants in the ferrets is that it lasts for two years, so that makes it more affordable for them. 
The last one I like to talk about is Iposan, and Iposan is a really nice drug. It binds uh, testosterone specifically in the prostate, and so it uh, inhibits it uptake and also inhibits the uh, androgen receptors. The semen quality itself is not affected, which means you can give it to older stud dogs when they start to have uh, prostatic hyperplasia and you don't have to castrate them and you can still use them. And this is just to show you the, the mechanism. So I, I use it quite a lot. Uh, it's not very expensive, which is nice. You give one tablet once daily for seven days, and it lasts for about six months. And then as soon as they start to have show any signs of hyperplasia again, you just repeat the, the dosage rate. It's also very nice when you castrate, uh, when you castrate a dog and say the dog has a very severe hyperplasia, it, it sh shrinks, sorry, I should have gone back there. It shrinks the prostate very, very quickly. Um, the problem you can have after castration is that the testosterone is in the body fat, and as the testosterone in the blood decreases, the it's, it's released from the body fat into the blood. And so you have testosterone for much longer after the castration. And when you give them iposan at the time of castration, you see um, the dog getting better very, very quickly. Right, I think that's the end of the talk. That's the last slide. Uh, we've got some questions. If, are you okay to answer some questions? Yes, yeah, go ahead. That's great. <coughs> I've talked for long enough. Sylvan is asking a question. Can alazine be used to reduce only benign tumours of the vagina? Or would it also not, work for... I think the... the we're not sure how it works. Um, there must be some progesterone receptors in the vaginal tumours. So it is a little bit trial and error. We don't because we can't look at the receptors themselves. So it's it's only uh, you can try it if it works. If it doesn't work, then there's no progesterone receptors in the in the tumours. Right. Okay. A quick um, question from Michaela: Could we see the ferret slide once more, please? Right. Yeah. It's really, really good in ferrets. Yeah, because it's obviously preventing that uh, hyperestrogenism in, in females, which kills a lot of them, doesn't it, if they get it very bad? Yeah, or they die. But if you if you treat the hyperestrogenism by, by spaying them, then they die of cushions later on in life. They develop almost 100% cushions in, in spayed animals in late life. In female ferrets? Yes. And what, what's the mechanism for that? I think what happens is that in when you neuter an animal, the FSH and LH is is very high because the mm. negative feedback mechanism doesn't work. If you implant them, the FSH and LH is very low. Right, and, so that helps. And that causes uh, cushions to develop in ferrets. They're very sensitive to that. So sorry, just to get clear, if they've got the, um, but if they have the implant, that should protect them against that? Yes, that protects them against the cushions. Yeah. Right, another question. Um, <clears throat> does desilorelin in females confer the health, health benefits that ovarohysterectomy does, e.g. reduction in pyometra incidence, etc., etc., and uh, tumours and so on? And that's from Oliver. It does reduce the incidence of pyometra because pyometra in bitches is a hormonal problem. It's not an infection problem. So if you stop a bitch from cycling and producing progesterone, then you improve, you decrease the amount of pyometra. I don't think that it decreases the mammary tumors because they, um, once they've had a few seasons, when you implant them later on in life, they're sort of predisposed for mammary tumors. But it prevents elective surgery in a in an animal, so that's one benefit. Um, another question here uh, from Kathir: Is there any contraindication in neutering while the bitch un is under phantom pregnancy? Yes, because she's producing prolactin, and you can sometimes. It's, it's not as frequent as we used to think, but sometimes what happens is that they will still produce milk for a very, very long time. It's very difficult to stop a neutered animal that is producing prolactin to stop. 
Okay. Yeah, so um, if they're in phantom pregnancy, you should <coughs> wait or treat the phantom pregnancy and then spay them afterwards. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly the advice that I remember from my reproduction yeah. lectures. Um, if Alizin is given to an older bitch with pyometra before surgery, how long does it take for the cervix to open? Usually 24 hours, something like that. And that was a question from Karen. Yeah. Um, but it does work quite well. I've s and sometimes it's it's quite dramatic when they empty out. Yeah. Right. This is a question from Octavian, and um, I don't think we really went into this, so this might not be one that we want to answer now. But I'll give I'll I'll ask the question anyway. When you have to do surgical insemination, do you have to inject the semen in both uterine horns or only one? would be enough. What day post ovulation would you do surgical insemination with frozen semen? That's a, a big question I know, sorry about that. Yeah I know, that's a, I think first of all you have to say that surgical um, insemination is regulated by the Royal College and can only be done if non-surgical has been you know, you have a reason for doing it surgically because you can do it non-surgically with a catheter or an endoscope Mm. So you can't just go in and say, okay, you know, I'm going to do a surgical AI. That would, that's in the yes. code of conduct. Um, and usually in <coughs> surgical AI, the semen is injected in both horns, yes. Um, I've had a question from, uh, or a statement from Stefan. Uh, for the poll, I said uh, the UK and Ireland and then Europe as a separate entity. And he said, I thought that the UK and Ireland are a part of Europe. So he is absolutely correct. <laughs> so I do apologise yes, for that. Yes, I Stefan. have to say that as well. Yes, <laughs> we were just trying. To I do try and say the continent and not Europe. Break down a little bit more, so I apologise. Yes. Um, how common is a low spermatic count in male dogs? Is that something you come across quite a lot? Sperm quality in dogs, um, you see. Quite a few dogs, or maybe you know, I tend to see probably a lot more than the the average. But uh, there's azoospermia is quite common in dogs. So you have dogs that are young and healthy and don't have any sperm at all. Then right. there's another group of dogs that lose their fertility very quite young in life. So I see quite a lot of dogs that have become infertile. They have side litters, but they're now maybe four or five years old and have already become infertile. And then there's a whole group of older dogs, so anything over seven, where I would say it's completely normal when they do start to have problems uh, with sperm count and quality of semen. Paul has a question here, Angelica. What are your views on elective caesareans? And if you perform them, at what point do you do them? Yes. Um, there's a big discussion at the moment about elective caesareans because of uh, legislation that's going to come in that vets can or should register every caesarean with a kennel club and then a bitch should not have more than two caesareans. And once they've had more than two caesareans, the puppies will not be registered anymore with a kennel club. Right, interesting. I th so, and this is for... It, I think basically they're very worried about breeds like Bulldogs, French Bulldogs, where the cesarean rate is over 80% now and you have hardly any self whelping bitches left. I think there is, I think a cesarean on the other side hand is a very useful, very, very successful operation. And so it can be very dangerous to make the decision. To, to do a cesarean for the vets more problematic because I think you could end up not doing a cesarean as quickly and you know lose some of the puppies. Elective cesareans I do do. Um, sometimes there are bitches that are not very good at whelping so I've done it for them. I've had two, three bitches where they seem to have a very strange pattern of having um, dead puppies and live puppies. So half the puppies were dead, half the puppies were alive, although they had a quick, normal birth. Um, there was no pattern, you know, a sort of dead, dead, alive, alive, dead. So it wasn't the first three alive, the last three dead. And when we did a cesarean, all of the puppies were alive and well on all three bitches. And so I think there are some bitches where the detachment, it's the, the puppies detached 
before they're actually due to whelp. And so they suffocate in the uterus, you know, within minutes of being born or maybe 20 minutes or half an hour. Um, I do do the electives. There's two ways of doing elective cesareans. Either you tell the owner to measure temperature um, and ring you as soon as the temperature drops and then you ask them to come to the surgery and you do a progesterone and the if the progesterone shows that there's no progesterone left then you can go ahead you can make sure that they do ovulation testing so that if they're 61 days or 63 days after ovulation 61 days after the mating then you know that the puppies are ready or you can wait until they go into first stage labor and then bring them in and see them. Lots of questions, Angelica. But it, are you okay to still plow through yes, a few yeah, more? Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, yeah sure. Is that okay? Yeah, um, absolutely. Many breeder clients demand antibiotic treatment pre-mating as a routine. Do you agree? And that's a question from Chris. Strongly disagree. I think that if you want to use any antibiotics, then it's post-mating or at the time of mating until afterwards because a bitch that's not been in season for six or seven months is does not have an infection. She would have had a pyo by now or would have had discharge by now. The time when you do get bacteria coming in is the time of mating and they're not pathogens, they're just bacteria. Sometimes I give antibiotics if you have a bitch that's a little bit older, might have a bit of cystic hyperplasia or a history of having had bigger litter than now they're declining because maybe the lining of the womb isn't so good. In general, if you're constantly giving antibiotics uh, as a preventative measure, especially in larger kennels, you build up huge resistances to antibiotics and then you end up with bacteria like Pseudomonas, which are not very <coughs> nice at all. So I really think one should be careful with the use of antibiotics. David is asking a question, would you be prepared to give your views on early neutering pre or post first season in bitches? Um, I didn't put my neutering, I mean, there's, I do a whole thing on do we neuter too much, what's the idea? Because in northern European countries, neutering is um, considered mutilation and it's illegal. And we neuter, at, most of us, at six months, but early neutering is starting in the UK at eight weeks. And early neutering is quite common in the US, for example, where puppies are either sold as breeding animals and then they're entire and you pay a lot more, all the puppies are already neutered when you pick them up at eight weeks and then they're pets and we mm. think that's horrific or most of us think gosh eight weeks poor puppies but six months really from a reproductive point of view isn't much different there's also a really interesting uh, study from the american society of theory where they looked uh, at the increase of cancers so of course if you take out all the reproductive organs, you're not going to get ovarian cancer or pyometra because the organ isn't there. But, you know, you could argue taking the ears of white cats and they wouldn't get melanoma. Um, so there isn't really any other cases where we remove an organ to prevent disease later on in life. The mammary tumors, obviously, it works better if you do it before the first season. The question, I think, with is... Do you think an animal matures until the first season, or do you think that is in the development? And I find that the the problem I have is that we advise all our owners really to neuter animals the same way we advise them to vaccinate an animal. And I think we should be a little bit more careful and discuss different options and say, you know, there's advantages to neutering, there's disadvantages, there's incontinence, there's obesity, there are certain cancers that increase with neutering, and there are advantages. And then let the owners make the decision. Good. Thank you very much. Thanks, Angelica. Take care. Bye-bye.